Hello, and welcome to the Great Tech BIMA Global Digital Conference 2019. I'm James Parsons Moore. I'm a Customer Success Manager for Great Tech. I have over 20 years industry experience as an architectural technician and over 11 years working in the Autodesk channel. This is my class on landscape architecture, design development using Revit. At Great Tech, the four main principles of what we deliver fall under this. Great Tech design, BIM design using Autodesk products and enhanced with the Great Tech power packs. Great Tech simulate, using your BIM model to simulate your designs for use in the real world with market leading Great Tech head -ongers. Great Tech fabricate, taking BIM deliverables through to finished fabricated products and site delivery. And Great Tech manage, managing all of your company's work in progress, BIM data and IP for collaborating with an external common data environment. This presentation and accompanying demonstrations will look at the modeling design tools within Revit accompanied by CS Artisan RD for landscape architect and design development workflows. To conclude in this presentation, you'll understand workflows between architecture models and landscape, creating an existing tree survey, and then workflows for developing the landscape model through the stages, including hard landscape, soft landscape, planting, topographical manipulation, and placing content. The aim is for you to be able to take a model from this, an existing survey topography, to this, a fully developed landscape des design. The workflows that we're going to look at are basically evolved around this. An existing topographical survey will take place, and that information will be exported and produced and provided for you, either in a CAD format or CSV format. The architect would then take their template, create a new Revit project, import that data in creating topographical services aligned to the survey. They would then develop that into a design for the new construction phases um, to give the outline for the existing, sorry, for the external works. They can then issue that if it's old school via email through FTP website, hopefully for a common data environment. The landscape architect would then retrieve that using their own internal landscape architecture templates. They would produce a model based around the main design, but developed. From here, we can take existing tree survey information in to aid this. Now, ideally, we could do this via CSV format. I'm going to show you some workflows around that. The workflows that we're going to go through involve around linking architects' models into a landscape model. We're going to copy the topography from theirs into the landscape model. We're going to place some existing trees. We're going to work on some sketch designs, mostly in 2D. We're then going to develop those as concepts and then look at the detailed development of them as well, aligning them with the work stages that we'd work through. So first things first, from an architect to a landscape architect. A project is usually started by an architect who is then taking responsibility for external work designs. This is then handed over to the landscape architect and civil engineer to produce more detailed designs, specifications and solutions. The process of, of developing the design from the architect's initial designs can be complicated if we're using CAD data, but equally difficult if they have a Revit model. However, if you know some simple workflows, this process could be made much easier. In this video, we're going to show you how to do that. So we're going to work in an existing site. We've developed, we're using phasing in this model, but this um, project that we're working on here was started from a um, a bespoke template created for the landscape architect. All we're simply doing is linking in the architect's model, which has been downloaded from the common data environment. From here, we are going to pull in the coordinate system. So we're going to acquire the coordinates from the architect's model so that we know we're working in the same place. Because the landscape architect and the architect are both utilizing phasing in a simple way, we can use this to our benefit. Our existing phases will show the existing phases within the architect's model, and the proposed phases, the new construction phases, will show the proposal 
by the architect, as we can see on the screen in front of you. So a lot of people don't know this, but if you have a linked file, we can tab into the geometry that's inside it. So as you can see there, we're hovering over it, hitting tab, and it will allow us to highlight the topo surface within that linked file. You can't do anything with it as in manipulating, changing the data, but you can select it. Now, when you select it, your um, ribbon at the top will show you copy tools. So you can actually copy that information onto your clipboard and then paste it to the same place in your file. Now we have an existing topo surface in our file, which exactly mimics what happens in the architect's mind. What we can do then you see is we have told it to demolish at the new construction phase, which means it will be removed. What we're going to do, we're going to do exactly the same for the proposed topo surface in the architect's model. You can see it's slightly different. They've um, filled in uh, an area there. So just to make it easier to see what's going on, I'm just going to unload the architect's model. Now they put a proposed road in there, in theirs, which was a um, a sub-region to the topo surface as well, which is why that came from. So as you can see, if we highlight them and look at the properties, you can see they're on the correct places. So now we have our topo surface in there. What we want to do is place some trees. Now, quite often the architect won't have the benefit of having all of this information, but if they have, they can take that in and we can utilize their information. But if they haven't, we can run this workflow. So using traditional workflows, there is no easy way to place existing trees as well as in there, but it's difficult. You can't place elements via coordinates very easily like you can in AutoCAD. The family that you'd need to place to actually mimic the information given to you in the tree survey is very complicated. It has to be very complicated to change all the information. If you're thinking about it, we've got the canopy height, the total height, the stem diameter or the trunk diameter, whatever you want to call it, the crown at different heights can change as well, the condition, everything. There's a lot of data there which has to be completely mimicked in the Revit family. Um, you need to place them geographically. As I was saying, that's difficult in Revit. If you have it in AutoCAD, so some AutoCAD files can be brought in with a tree base there and that'll be a block, you can map that and obviously you can click on it to the same place. But again, it's a little bit difficult. You still need that intelligent family as well to do it. Ideally, the arboriculturist will record the tree survey in a spreadsheet form as set out in BS5837. If this is done, we, we can actually map it using one of the tools in CSF Artisan RV, and that's what I'm going to show you next. So across your ribbon, we simply have a tab for Artisan. In there is an existing tree panel, and if we click the place tree button, it will bring up the place existing tree manager. I'm just gonna select a pre-used um, mapping here. Because we've done this one before, our columns in the Excel spreadsheet that you will see in front of you are already aligned to match to the parameters set out in the families, but we can do those retrospectively. As you can see, this is from an existing tree survey um, to BS5837. It's got all of the information there that we need. So I'm just gonna choose that one to bring into Revit. Now on the left hand side here, it will map all of that information. As you can see, we have the, the element ID, the species, its height, everything. And the blue ones are mapped to parameters. And you can see those parameters on the right. So we have inside the Excel, okay, and then we have what it needs to be mapped to. And we can just right click on it to map it to a different one. On the right hand side, we can set the units. So if it's in meters, we can set it to meters. But certain ones like, for example, in this one, the same diameter is millimeters. I'm just going to tell it to import. Once that's done, all of that data is in Revit. We haven't placed anything yet, but it's all of them. And as you can see, even the condition of the trees themselves. Now, when we place them, ideally, what we're going to do here is place it in 2D. It will be a lot quicker to place it in 2D in this plan first, because to create all of the trees in 3D is difficult. We can color fill it. We can tag it as well. But what I'm going to do here is tell it that the Easings and Northings in the tree survey match the Easings and Northings in my Revit file. If I only pick one tree and tell it to place, it will only place that one tree. So we have to control A here to select all of them. 
I'm going to place all of the trees. It takes about 30 seconds to do this. I'll just skip through that to show you that all the trees are placed. You can see in the background how that looks. So all of the trees are placed, X, Y coordinates. We, then there's no Z coordinates in here because it's not onto the topography because it's just in 2D at the moment. So you see the colours as well match its condition as well. We didn't tell it to colour fill it, so it's just the lines around the outside. What I've done here, I've just grouped all the trees with their by their conditions. I can highlight all the trees that need to be removed and then tell it to show them in Revit. So in my properties in Revit, it will just show you all 17 trees that were just selected and it will show you that the retention category is used. We need to remove them. So I can just tell them to demolish as a new construction phase. Now I'm just going to go into my proposed 3D view quickly. And as you, can see, as you can see, we can't see anything because I told them to come in in 2D only for now. So there'll be nothing appearing here. Likewise, in the tree demo for 3D. However, they're there in 2D. I've created some phasing on this so that the trees that have to be removed are red and the existing trees that have to be retained are grey. And as pointed out before, I selected the 2D symbol only. What I'm going to do now, because you can, if you want, you can not click that and they'll come in in 3D. I'm going to do it retrospectively. So I'm going to select all of the trees in this view. In my properties, I'm just going to filter out the ones that the, uh, so trees only, the planting only. And then at the bottom of the properties tool again, it says 2D only. I'm just going to untick that and let it work. This can take five to 10 minutes. There's a lot of data that it's trying to pull into there. But obviously I've skipped through that for the purposes of the demonstration. And now if we go into one of my 3D views, let's go into an existing 3D. Oh, shift lock just held there for some reason. You can now see in 3D all of my trees. If we select them, you can see all of the parameters are actually mimicking what the tree survey said. So there will be different heights, different stem diameters, different canopy heights, etc. And now in my tree, um, 3D tree demo, Tongue twister, you can see I've put again some phasing on here to show all of the trees that have to be removed show red. Likewise, I can I've already got in here a existing tree survey. And now this should match completely the information that was issued originally in the um, tree survey that were issued. So we've got our tree data in there. Let's look at some techniques for doing designs. Now, a tip, this is a tip that I give everybody. Create a view in Revit that will not go on any sheet. I always do that whether I'm doing architectural workflows, structural workflows, MEP, it, landscape architecture, it doesn't matter. It's where we can do sketches, we can do some layouts, we can do 2D geometry, we can import 2D CAD data and tell it to be in this view only. So as I said, this, this view can be used to create 2D sketches. And like I said, when you bring a, an AutoCAD file in, you can link it, it's not a problem. There's an option for current view only. It brings it in like a detail element, like an annotation. So it won't just appear everywhere else. It's just in that view. So if you've done any sketches in AutoCAD, you 100% can use them. So let's look at some of those workflows. So in here, I've got a view. It's a floor plan. It's called Proposed Site Working. Proposed on your annotate tab, don't forget everything here is view specific. I've just created a few um, line styles. So down here under soft landscaping, I'm just going to sketch some lines. It's really simple. Obviously, I'm not going to worry too much about the size on this, but you, you can trace them wherever you want. Just here, I'm just going to do I don't know, a circle or something just to give you an idea of the representation. I've done that as a hard landscape, it's a different color. That's fine. I'm just going to write some text inside here. Saying that is soft landscape. Now remember, this is just line work. So at the moment, there's no intelligence to tag. So I'm just putting a note in here for myself so I know what it is. Once I've done that, I'll just change the size because that's coming up as quite small.
There we go. Let's just tweak that up, move it here. Fantastic. Now, very early in the design, you might want to actually give that a representation via a hash pattern, or as we call it in Revit, a fill pattern. So in here, I've created two fill patterns, one for hard landscape and one for soft landscaping. So because the lines are there, I've just picked them for the boundary. So we'll just refer back to them. There we go. So we've got a hard landscaping fill pattern there, which can obviously be linked to a legend. We can get areas out of this as well. I'm just going to do the same for the soft landscaping actually. I'm just going to lock those lines as well. So if I move the lines, the boundary will change as well. So it's always a very important thing to do inside the record just to make sure that everything is connected. Now let's talk about hard landscaping. So hard landscaping is a key part of the deliverables on any landscape architecture project. There was no native tool inside Revit as search for paving, roads, paths, etc. Um, we tend to use the floor tool to mimic an external floor area. With this, we can apply buildups. Uh, we can modify points to create gullies, levels, and falls, and create surface patterns applied to them for rendering purposes and for identifying what that would be. You can smart tag and schedule that information accordingly as well. So in this video, we're going to go through some of the workflows. So in here, I'm just going to look at this road that the architect had sketched in. It is a topo surface at the minute and it's got a material applied to it, that's fine. And it's actually pulled that material in from the architect's model as well, which is good. So like I said, we could use the floor tool. Now, but on, to trace over that, it's a bit long-winded. Let's just have a look at some of the floors that we've got. We've got one in here for paving, for example. So I'm just going to show you how that's built up very quickly. So it's just built up with a number of layers where we've got materials applied to it. So I've just noticed here that it's got interior as the function. If you set it to exterior, it means we can schedule them separately to the um, inter internal floors as well. So in the artisan tool set, we've got this tool, it's called Topo to Floor. So it's there um, to help you with things like this. We can simply select a topo surface or subregion, preferably, and just press finish here and we can tell it which of our floors inside our Revit project we want to actually turn and actually map onto that topo surface. We can tell it what we want to do with the topography in that area as well. Now, in this case, we're just going to place it below. The good thing about this is it will follow the contour. So if you've got quite steep contours, it will follow it as well by modifying the floor itself. There we go. It's created points all around it. It's the same you've, you've, if you've worked in Revit, you've seen that message before. Um, some of the lines might be slightly off axis. It doesn't matter. It's here for me on my, on my project in this case. So as you can see, that um, road now has a build-up to it. And from there, obviously, we can get volumes, we can get areas, we get full build-ups of all of the materials that we are potentially going to need. And it will also um, aid with our cut and fill a little bit later on. I'm just going to go into a plan view here and I'm just going to zoom into this area and concentrate on here because I'm just going to do a, an area of raised paving around here. So I'm just going to tab into my topo surface. I'm going to edit that boundary and copy this boundary to my clipboard. Now boundaries are boundary conditions between whichever file, it could be a topo surface or path, it doesn't matter. What I'm going to do here, just to go through the workflows again, is create a new subregion and paste that boundary that I copied into this subregion. I'm then going to offset it 100 millimeters or 0.1 of a meter with no copy. So it just basically flips it in in all directions by 100 millimeters. So I've now got a new subregion in, in this area. like so. Now I could give that um, a material uh, of paving, for example. Now I'm doing this out of order, obviously what you probably do is do it all as a topo surface subregion first and then turn them into 
road later on, but to show you the tools and workflows, this is how I'm looking at. So then I'm going to run the utility in Artisan again to turn that into a topo surface. Now, I think this one's completely flat. However, if this was on a slight slope, it would follow the slope, which is why it's worthwhile doing it. Once I've picked it, again, we can see all of the information about that. What I'm going to do, I'm just going to raise it up now, uh, 75 millimetres. There we go. And you see there's a clear step up there now. Now let's talk about curves. Curves is a bit of a taboo subject when it comes to landscape. There's several different techniques that I've heard people using, and it depends what you're doing. I've heard people use walls, I've heard people do uh, in-place families and sweeps, railings, all sorts. I'm going to use the slab edge under the structural tab. Now with the slab edge tool, I've just created uh, a curved path and curved road in here. If we just have a look in there, what we've got under our types, I have a profile that I've created of 100 mil by 100 mil. Um, I've called it curved profile. I've done two, one is that's path hosted and one that's road hosted, and they, they insert in different ways. So let's just have a look at that very quick. So let's go down to our profiles and have a look at the curve profile in here for path hosted. If I right click on it and say edit, it will open up that profile. It's a very simple profile, a couple of parameters in it so you can actually change it, duplicate and change the size. I've um, looked at the different areas and I've just put a curve on one of the, a little fillet on one of the sides. So again, if I go back to my slab edge tool, it's a little bit like the fascia tool inside Revit. Basically, I can just pick edges of my floor and it will basically apply a sweep along them. I've done them out of order. It doesn't matter. It actually kind of groups them all together. And so much so, if I come out of it and just highlight one of them, I can then press this button, add, remove segments. I can even, I'm doing this individually, but you can use the tab tool and it will tab all the way around. So I'll just skip to that very quickly to show you what it looks like. Let's go to a floor plan so you can see what it looks like. Yeah, that's a pretty good representation of what we want. And I'll just pull a little section through to show you what it's like from that view as well. As you can see, that's a long way towards the detail that we want to do. Bear in mind as well, um, the information is going to be in there for materials, lengths of um, curves, etc. as well. Let's just have a look at another hard landscaping area just here. Just show you another tool. I'm just going to do some slabs here. So again, it's just using the floor tool this time. I'm just going to use the floor tool natively here to show you the tool. Okay, on here I've got a surface pattern to my uh, upper material, my upper layer of it. Um, for slabs, so they are, I think, a 600 by 600 slabs. What I'm going to do is modify sub elements and add a point in. I'm going to place a dome somewhere like this. There we go. Just a drainage dome. Now I could have put that anywhere. After that, we can modify sub elements and tell that to go down a certain distance. I'm putting a minus figure in there and telling it to go down at 150 mil. Now that's going to skew the surface patterns. Now this isn't good for every surface pattern, but native, nice, easy ones out of Revit just line based ones, we can actually manipulate that line work quite easily. Just here I'm using the align tool just to align the, the surface pattern with the edges of my um, floor itself. You see it actually makes it really quite neat. There you go. Which isn't too bad at all. Just to show you that there is a slope on there, let's pull a little section through just to show you what it looks like. I'm just going to select the section, save some of the settings before we go into it as well. I'm just going to shorten it up and tell it to be a little bit of a smaller scale, maybe 20, and change it from course to fine detail so that we can see all the build ups inside it. There we go. And you can see how the whole floor cranks. Now we wouldn't dig it and pour the materials in like that. Usually the hardcore will be flat and then we would uh, tap, um, taper down the, the bedding material to make any slopes. So to do that all I'm going to do is the actual bedding material, just here we've got a 300 mil build, I'm going to make it variable in my floor build up. If we do that watch what happens. You see the, the material below it stays horizontal. The 
Material that I told to be variable papers down. And then any material on top of it, in this case the slabs, will just simply follow the um, actual line of it. Let's look about look at sorry soft landscaping then. The creation of soft landscaping will be accomplished by a simple workflow, very, very similar to what we're doing with a hard landscaping. Again, we can create a sketch area, turn the sketch area into a topographical subregion, create a floor to match the subregion, and then we can place planting, if it is a planting bed, on that. So we're going to go on to planting in a minute, but I'm going to show you a nice little workflow here using some tools in Revit, a couple of tools in Artisan as well. So I've created a sketch in my work in progress, and it is just a blue line here for water. I'm going to put a water feature in here, a, a pond of some description, lake, whatever you want to call it. It's a small one, it's a pond to me. And again, in here, to give it a representation, early doors, I might just put a fill pattern in. I've just created a fill pattern with a solid blue um, pattern here. And I'm just going to lock, place it on there. Again, you could lock it if you wanted. So just again, early doors, just create some concepts. There's no reason why you can't do that. Obviously that doesn't show in 3D. I'm gonna create a subregion. So again, I can pick lines and just tap around there and I'm gonna create a subregion completely matching what happened there. Now the difference between a subregion and that is, I'm just going to apply a material of water to there, which is identical. Um, it's actually going to drape onto the topography. And as you can see, it's like that. Now, water obviously doesn't sit like that, but early, it's enough to give a very simple uh, representation of what we're doing. Now, a traditional workflow that people use for stuff like this is using something called a building pack, which is native to Revit. I've created, it's like a floor. I've created a depth of two meters on this to give it a material the same as my topo surface. Now you can't pick the lines to the subregion in 3D. You can't even pick them in 2D, which is why we can refer back to our work in progress to pick those lines. I'm just going to again match the boundaries and give it a minus offset so it gives it a depth to the top of it. As you can see, what that's done, what that's, done that's made a flat floor building pad, and it is basically and punch straight through the topo surface, like so. Retain the walls in there. If you want to do that, that's absolutely fine, especially if you're going straight down. I'm going to show you another workflow here. Um, it's for this sort of situation, it works well. It's using an area pad tool in Artisan. So again, all I'm going to do is pick the topo surface and I'm going to run through this. I'm going to tell it what level I'm going to put this floor at. Now, the base level of my project is zero on here. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to let's go 0.5 meters below that. I'm going to put an embankment slope of 45 degrees. I'm going to use a floor of that I've called water lake. It's just got to build up the same as my pattern. You can put cut and fill into a 2D view if you want. And it will show you areas that are being cut or filled, depending on whether you've given a plus or minus. You press OK, finish, and it will run it. And just like that, it has placed the water 0.5 meters below my base level, and it has put an embankment in of 45 degrees all the way around, changing the topography as we go. That gives it a really nice effect for me. And we can do that for lots of things. Obviously, that could just be a building pad. It could be an area that you want to embank down. We could have changed the embankment on there as well um, to make sure that it, it, it works. Let's look at proposed planting. Uh, Revit natively, natively does have planting um, under a category. It usually contains an RPC, rich photometric content, um, and it, it's a representation of planting. They can look okay, they look like cardboard cutouts um, usually, but if you um, render your scene, it will obviously look more realistic. It's basically made by lots of photos being all cut together. Artisan has bespoke planting for both concept and detail schemes. And, I'm going to run you through those. So first things first, concept planting. Here I'm going to do a linear one, and I've just created another top um, subregion. I want topography to do an area. I'm going to use the uh, concept planting tool. This is just a text parameter that's added into it to give it a location. And again, it's a text um, parameter for the description. 
which we will tag after. I've got different shades. So there's only two at the moment, but we've got autumn and summer. We can change the, the shading on those as well. So again, we've got area, linear, and singular on those that we want. We can choose what sort of tag we're going to use. I'm just going to use a simple tag at the minute. I'm just going to tag it by name, but you could put numbers in there as well. I'm going to select the subregion. Could do it to a floor as well. And then you see it just very simply just put in some sort of representation of some planting that you want to put in there. I'm going to do the same for my line down here. As you can see, um, we're going to do it on a line. This is not going to be lake side, it's going to be road side. This one just here. So again, I'm just going to change that parameter and place it on that line. It's simply picking the lines that I've put in. And let's put them in there. It's quite dense in here, but that's fine. We could have gone into it and changed the density if we wanted to spread them out more. And this is a native hedge, there's other versions of it as well. Let's play singular, we give it a diameter, and we we just click to place. It is very, very simple. I'm just going to put like a little copse over here. I can change the diameter on that, place some more larger ones. There we go. Um, let's go back into it and change it to clump as well. So this time we can put a clump, it's three trees, and it does, as you can see with the singular one as well, it randomizes the color. Doing a clump will actually randomize its location within that clump as well. See, it rotates it around if we put it in. And there we go. We've got an area, we've got linear, and we've got single and clumps of singles as well. Let's go to our concept planting schedule that we've already got in there, and you can see how that information starts to build up really fast. Let's look at proposed planting details now. So this is, is much more detailed inside Artisan. We're going to use the create tool here rather than concept to create concept, it's just create. It's going to be called um, create detailed. Now this uses the web integrated um, side of Artisan where it's got Flora which is links to the NPS. Now from here I can pick a, a palette, I can go into Flora and create new palettes. I'm just going to create a woodland mix here. So we've got different woodland mixes that have been pre-created, but like I said, we can make our own anyway. It's very in-depth. So I'm just going to choose one of these. We've got options for area, linear, and singular as well, but I'm just going to show you some of them. So in here, it shows you the mixes that you can place. I'm going to place it within this topo surface over here by pressing the area tool, and then it comes in here. You can see the build-ups of everything across the top. Again, you can choose a location parameter. I'm going to choose lake side up here again. You can choose how you're going to tag it, how you want the graphics to look in 2D, what color field you want to place on it. I'm going to put soft landscaping in here. And you can choose place 2D only. You can go back and change it after as well. And again, I'm going to uh, press place planting and just left click in there. Let that work. Because I did it 2D only for now. It doesn't take much effort. And you see this is much more detailed in terms of its numbers. So all of these numbers are based on how um, you've set out those species and what their uh, diameter and their spread and their growth is going to be. In here. And you can choose percentages as well. You see you've got the area, the name of it, all written down. So I've just pressed edit and we've gone back into it. You can actually see the buildups of it. On the far right hand side, you can see the percentages. You can actually grow the planting as well. The percentages is the same, but you can see for its ages how it, the, the size of it all changes in there. Now, this isn't in 3D at the moment, so you can't see it there. I'm just going to do a linear one down here as well, so you can see that. Looking like an avenue of trees, let's have a look at that. So let's just look at this species here. I'm going to press line. Again, we can just go through the settings. I, I want to do this um, in 3D. The hedge um, features, and you can place double hedges. You can change the elevational symbol and plan symbol as well. And we just simply select the line and finish. Now, we've got 58 in here. 
it's a little bit on the dense side. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to press edit and highlight one of them and have a look at these. Now, these are very immature, they're only two years old, so they're definitely not going to work. So what I'm going to do is come in here and have a look. Let's look at growing them as well. Can you see what it says here? The specification age is two, but after planted 29 years, it takes you up to the ultimate spread, ultimate height. Now, based on those, I, I need to spread them out more. So I'm going to do it so there's only nine. And it will just grow them. That simple. It doesn't take long at all. So you notice how I'm not doing this through red, but I'm actually doing this part of it through the artisan tool. But it just changes all of the information inside the Reddit content. Let's have a look at that in 3D just to see what they look like. So this is obviously at full maturity now. We can change it back afterwards, but I wanted to see what they are native to Reddit. Those are the RPC content. What we've done at Artisan is we've given you options of what we can do. So for a start, I'm going to turn off the RPC. I'll turn off the cardboard cutout, but ultimately, that won't look like RPC content when you render it either. It will carry on looking like the, um, the artisan one. You can toggle the way you can either have it primitive or using voxels. And again, it's an acquired taste. I can even make it look wireframe as well. Again, it's an acquired taste. There's options in there, which is what I think is, uh, is very important to this situation. Okay. Let's look at putting some site components in. So site components can be created using native Revit families for items such as benches, shelters, and recycled storage. For fences, we can use um, elements such as railings. That's what we've traditionally used. That got a lot better in 2018 because you can host them onto a top host surface now. Uh, there's a bespoke fence tool inside Artisan for doing this as well. I will show you how to do them. And then we can create planters really easy. Um, we use the wall tool and the floor tool for filling in what we're going to put inside the planter. We can then group them if we're going to have the same sort of planter in multiple places. But if we edit one, it edits more, it edits more. So let's look at placing some fencing. So again, I've just drawn some lines in here to represent where I want some fences to go. Just line work. And I've done another fence just around the edge of my uh, pond up there. I don't want people falling in, and I've just done. Um, another fence down here. So like I said, we've, we've got a tool inside, so I'll come back to that in a minute. I'm just going to use a native railings tool. Now I'm just using native ones as well that come out of the box with Revit in this one. So I'm just going to use a steel chain link fence. It is just a railing with posts, um, balustrades of posts, and um, in between them there is a family for the, uh, the, the chain link. So I've just placed that onto that line by using thick line. Now, as you can see, I didn't pick a host at all, so it just this works on floors as well. And as you can see, that's not been too bad a job, really. It's a fairly simple fence. Okay, I'm going to do a railing. I'm going to do it around my lake pond. Sorry, I'm going to do it around here, like I said. I don't want people falling in where it's quite steep into it. And I'm going to pick the host while I'm doing the tool this time. So it'll automatically be done. Looks like this one's a little bit complicated and the railings might have got stuck. We'll go and look at it in a moment. And again, I'm just going to do this similar here. And I'm just going to pick down here and pick the topo surface. In 3D. So I've got that one just there around the top of my lake. You can see how that follows the contours nicely around. And then over here, we've got a different area, just nice and flat. I'm just gonna change this fence to a different one. There we go, you can see how that works. There's quite a few that come out of the box, but they're, they're fairly easy to make as well. Right, so I'm just gonna delete these. And let's look at using the artisan tool for doing it as well. So the artisan, we have a tool for create a fence. It's completely different. It doesn't place a railing along a line, start using a smart array. So you can choose which family base you want to do. 
You can do it in 2D or 3D and drape it on the topography. You can choose a location as well. So you have different build-ups in here where you can state the posts and what's going in between as well. So horizontal rails in this uh, for this one. You can also duplicate it and change the settings, obviously. Again, all I'm going to do, pick lines. Again, we're referring back to those lines that we put in as part of our design development. Give it a few moments to work. And we can go and have a look at that. Now, it is different. That's not all one element now. So this is um, separate families, you can see in my properties. Uh, so if you wanted to swap one of them out for a gate, for example, it's easy or a different sort of fence. You can do that. It's just placing them smartly along the line that you chose and putting it onto the topography. Let's look at a more complicated one here. So this is a bugbear of mine now, and like everybody going back. I'm going to put a fixed panel one in here. So I've just shown you a different one. A fixed panel fence here with some gravel boards. So this one is quite a steep topography going up. So I'm just going to look at the settings. It's again, we've got gravel boards, we've got panels, we've got posts. You can see what it's going to look like. Obviously, the steeper it is. So I'm just going to finish it, hold it to drape on the topography, and let's look at that in 3D. There we go. Let's just spin around it a little bit so you can see it a bit more. And you can see just there, we've got a gravel board at the bottom, but as we're coming up the steep slope, we have more gravel boards filling the bottom. Perfect. I like everything. There is obviously you can do takeoff on this and we can go into fencing schedule, see the data that is embedded into there and how many posts we need, what is the total length, all of that sort of information. Got just an area of hard landscaping around here. I'm just going to draw some plants on here really quick. Native stuff, Revit walls. I've created a wall type, which is whatever it needs to be. This is just brick work, it could be concrete, it could be whatever you want it to be, marble, anything really. I'm going to give it a base and a height. I'm just going to sketch where it is. Now, because I'm doing this on a slab, it's quite easy to sketch it. I know the size of it, and I can align it there. go and inside it I'm going to put a floor this one I'm going to put a planter in here which is going to have some some soil some topsoil some mulch in it whatever it needs to be put it in a meter above so it's being built off of the floor there we go I'm not going to join uh, not tell the walls to go but I'm going to join the geometry so it looks right when I cut through it I'm going to turn that into a group just by highlighting it and using the create group tool. I'm going to call it a name, planter, obviously be more specific if you've got multiple planters in there. I'm going to change the insertion point to this corner, rotate this around so it's aligned with it. Be nice and neat about this bugbear of mine. Make sure people do this. And now I'm just going to copy that across to here. And obviously this can be copied anywhere, rotated, etc. Now those floors do overlap, but you can join them um, when you cut it through. one just here right next to it and make it a little bit lower there we go and this time I'm going to put floor in there but I'm going to choose a different floor I'm going to put a reflective pool in there so this is just a, a different floor it's not a lake it's a little bit murky for this one it could be a pond if you wanted I want it a bit more clear this time so I'm going to choose a different floor and put some flooring in here. So again, same tool as before, pick walls, I hit tab, and select all of them on the entire face, green tick, I don't want them to come up to the bottom, but I do want to join the geometry. There we go, we've got my reflective pool in there as well. <clears throat> Pretty basic, but you get the idea. Again, just to reiterate, as a group, I can edit one of the groups, I'm just going to tell my walls to go down a little bit, a little bit higher. So if you watch the second group at the bottom of there, once I've changed this one, the other one will change as well. There we go, perfect. Cutting down on the workflows and the need to repeat work that you're doing. 
finishing touches. Let's put some site components in there. Let's use the component tool. The ones that I'm using here are out of the box. You can go to a manufacturer's websites. You can create your own. There's lots of ways to add this. I'm going to put a bin here because that's nice. Let's put a uh, cycle rack. The benches in as well. Obviously, these are components. You can schedule them. It's really easy. I'm just going to rotate that around. I'm just doing it really rough, but you get the idea. Wonderful. Have a look in 3D. You can see you have 3D objects. You can put symbols on top of them where it hides the 3D geometry, so it puts a symbology in there. It's just really easy to do when you get to this sort of level. And there we come to the end. So thank you very much. Um, I'm now going to open it up to any questions that you may have. Again, thank you very much for